Last week, you were talking about uh, parents and children. Stephen gave us a whole load of statistics. And as well as uh, telling us how difficult things are for many children in New Zealand, they also told us that there's something wrong with marriages in New Zealand. And Shane did it again today. The average marriage in New Zealand doesn't last 60 plus years, doesn't last 50 years, doesn't last 40 years, doesn't last 30 years, doesn't last 20 years, doesn't even last 15 years. Half the marriages are ended before 15 years. There's something seriously wrong. And of course you don't need the statistics to tell you. If we look around our families, our friends, that too tells us that something is deeply wrong. For the last year and a bit, I've been part of a a group that the New Zealand Christian Network has set up, uh, one of whose goals is to try to to see what can be done to to begin putting things right, Um, or at least what churches can do to begin putting things right. And the more I've shared in that group, the more I'm convinced that what's wrong is the way in which we... We think about and see and imagine marriage. You see, I think that when our society starts to think about marriage, that the picture we have in our minds is a picture that Hollywood has given us. It's like the picture that's in the background to my slide. Um, We imagine uh, the the love story that leads up to the wedding Uh, And the wedding is, of course, a couple who are immaculately groomed, uh, made up, uh, coiffed, beautifully dressed, handsome as, and uh, the highlight of the whole thing is the kiss. And we imagine that marriage, that's what marriage is, and we imagine that the story is uh, us as the, the stars of the story. Um, And that's the picture that we have, and it's the picture that our our society has. But it's a picture that owes so much more to Hollywood than it does to the Bible. When (coughs) Jesus talks about marriage, he doesn't talk about love. And when Jesus talks about love, he doesn't talk about marriage. That already is a clue that something is wrong somewhere. When Jesus talks about marriage... He, on more than one occasion, goes back to Genesis chapter 2. And, though it may surprise you, Genesis chapter 2, having lots to say about uh, the relationship of man and woman, and about, therefore, marriage, uh, it ends with the punchline, that's why the two, uh, that's why a man leaves his, hus- his father and mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. But there's nothing in the chapter about love. There's nothing in the chapter about romance, There's nothing in the chapter about uh, a wonderful wedding with an immaculately groomed pair of people who who kiss. Um, There's something which isn't quite gelling here. But there's an alternative to the Hollywood picture, and it's an alternative which is surprisingly popular in our world. It's as if people around us have got that something is wrong, and they understand that. There's this guy called uh, Seth Adam Smith, and I've no idea who Seth Adam Smith is. Um, I'd never heard of him until towards the end of last year. um, He posted an article on a little online magazine, and the article on the little online magazine was so popular that the little online magazine's website crashed. Um, The thing went viral. And the article was about marriage. Uh, actually, the, the picture on the, in the background is Seth Adam Smith and his wife at their wedding. Uh, this, is the, the, this is where he put the article onto his own website after the little magazine's website crashed because too many people were visiting it. And the title of the, of the article was Marriage Isn't For You. In the article, he talks about how before he and his wife were, 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 getting, were, were married, were, as they were leading up to the marriage, he started to get cold feet and to wonder, is, there, is this thing right? Am I making a big mistake? Um, and he chatted to his dad. And his dad gave him some remarkably sensible advice. Here's Seth's dad's advice. Seth, you're being totally selfish. 
So I'm going to make this really simple. Marriage isn't for you. You don't marry to make yourself happy. You marry to make someone else happy. More than that, your marriage isn't for yourself. You're marrying for a family. Not just for the in-laws and all that nonsense, but for your future children. Who do you want to help you raise them? Who do you want to influence them? Marriage isn't for you. It's not about you. That was Seth's dad's advice. And that was the heart of this little article, which what became so popular on the internet that it crashed the website that housed it. You see, it's not just Christians who realize that there's something wrong with the Hollywood picture. It, it, it's something which is deep inbuilt into all of us. It's deep inbuilt into all of us because that's the way the Creator made us. There in Genesis chapter 2, you see, we're told. We're told it's, it's not good for human beings to be alone. And then we're told, um, I will make a helper like him. Now, there's all sorts of stuff in there we need to explain. We need to explain about helpers, because helper sounds like an assistant, and that is not what Scripture is saying. If you look at where that word helper is used in the Bible, um, you discover that the helper is almost always the stronger and more powerful person helping the, more, the weaker and more helpless person. It's not about status. It is about, it's not good for human beings to be alone. We weren't created to be loners. We weren't created to be strong and powerful and capable and do everything. Sorry, those of you who think that's who you are, but that's not how you were made. It's not what you were made to be. Self-made men and women is the last thing we were made to be. We were made to be in partnership. We were made to need each other. And because we were made that way, it isn't just Christians who recognize there's something wrong with the Hollywood picture of marriage. Oh, oh, it's a wildly popular picture because it taps into all the things that people want. We all want to see ourselves as the hero of the story. We all want to imagine ourselves as film stars. We all want to imagine ourselves as being the couple in the picture. So that Hollywood picture of marriage is wonderfully popular because it appeals to all the things that we want. But because the other picture, the marriage isn't for you, it, it, it's about other people and not about you, that picture is also wildly popular, but it's expressed so simply by this guy who nobody's ever heard of before, um, Seth Adam Smith. Because it's the picture that God built into us from creation. But there's more. It's like one of these infomercials you see. But wait, there's more. He went on. To all who are reading this article, married, almost married, single, or even the sworn bachelor or bachelorette, I want you to know that marriage isn't for you. No true relationship of love is for you. Love is about the person you love. You see how this message that comes out of what his dad said to him is also deeply the message that comes out of the Bible. That's the kind of love that Jesus does talk about. That's the kind of love that Paul talks about. That's the kind of love that all through the Bible we get talked about. The love that isn't for you, it's for the other. Seth went on, and paradoxically, the more you truly love that person, the more love you receive. It's not just from your significant other, but from their friends and their family and thousands of others you would never have met if your love had remained self-centered. Truly, love and marriage, he concluded, isn't for you, it's for others. And that's the other view, the non-Hollywood view, the one that comes from the way the world was made. And that's the one that our world has forgotten until we get reminded by people like Seth Adam Smith and his blog post, journal article, Yep, there's more again. You see, it's not just Jesus who goes back to Genesis chapter 2 when they're talking about marriage. Paul does it as well. And he does it in Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> what Paul writes is something like this. Uh, 
Verse 31, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So Ephesians 5.31 is quoting from Genesis chapter 2, word for word. And it's all in the context of where he's been talking about marriage. And he goes on in verse 32, This is a great mystery. And I'm applying it to Christ and the church. You see, one of the key pictures that Paul keeps returning to when he wants to talk about the relationship between Jesus and us is marriage. And in doing that, Paul's taking up a picture that was already there in Jewish thought from the Old Testament, that the relationship between God and Israel was like the relationship between husband and wife. Think about that. Think about what that means. That means that God is saying to you, I want a relationship with you that involves uh, in sickness and in, in health, for better, for worse, and all that stuff. That's how God loves us. And it's how we're called to love God. Marriage is a picture of God's relationship with us, or the relationship God desires with us. Marriage is like that. Then it's something way, way deeper and stronger than the Hollywood picture. Is there anything stronger than love? Well, it depends what you mean by love. Uh, Love is stronger than love if you define love in the kind of way that, that God defines it for us, that Jesus defines it for us on the cross. And marriage is a picture of that, Paul tells us. You see, there's even more still. Um, because though Genesis chapter 2 tells us about the partnership between men and women, that we were made for each other, literally, Um, that we were designed for each other because we need each other. Genesis chapter 1 tells the story a bit differently because there at the heart of Genesis chapter 1's description of the creation of human beings, we read, So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And one of the things that tells us is that our relationships with each other, and in particular our relationship in marriage, is not merely a picture of God's love for us. It's also a picture of God's love for God, of the relationship within the Godhead, the relationship between Father and Son, and Son and Spirit. We don't often talk about Trinity anymore. Um, It's complicated, the math doesn't work, and nobody understands it. And so it's better we keep quiet about it. But one of the key things that that core piece of Christian doctrine that we no longer talk about much shows us, tells us, reveals to us is found in John's epistle when he says, God is love. The nature of what God is is that God is this this trinity, this three-in-one thing that the math doesn't work and we can't understand. And the love that that three-in-one is expressing, that's what our marriage should be echoing, reflecting, picturing. It's part, at least, of what it means to talk about the image of God being in human beings. So you see... Our world has it deeply and profoundly wrong. Marriage is not for us. It's not so that we can be stars in our own story. It's not so that we can be uh, the, the wonderfully handsome film stars. It's not so that we can be loved. It's so that we can love as God loves us. Are you getting it? But though it's true that marriage is not for us, it's for the person we marry, though it's true that marriage is to echo God's love for us, though it's true that marriage is to be the visible image of the love within the Godhead itself, all of that is impossible. That's the bad news. Look through the Bible. 
Count up the failed marriages or the broken marriages. Then count up the good ones. By my reckoning, there are far, far more failed and broken marriages in the Bible than good ones. Start with Abraham. Great marriage. Except he's sleeping with the servant girl and having children by her. And that's just the start. There are more failed marriages and failing marriages in the Bible than good ones because the Bible is above all else realistic. And that's what our world is like, and it's what their world was like two, three thousand years ago. Things haven't changed. Human beings were broken then, and we're broken now. And because we're broken, we need God's help. And we need God's help just as much in marriage as we do in every other area of life. We need God's help and forgiveness just as we need our husband or wife's help and forgiveness because we're broken. And if marriage is an echo of God's love for us, if marriage is an echo of the the love within the Trinity, then of course we won't live up to it. We can't. Because we are broken, all of us. And that's why there are more broken marriages in the Bible than good ones. Because every marriage is broken. Even the ones that have lasted 40, 50, 60 years. Because the human beings that compose that marriage are broken. And we need each other's forgiveness and God's forgiveness. We need each other's help and God's help. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it blows my mind when I read in the Bible that marriage is a picture of your relationship with us, of your love for us. When I think of you on that cross, it blows my mind to think that marriage is supposed to be like that love. When I stretch myself further and begin to catch echoes that this human relationship is supposed to be an echo and a reflection of the relationship within the Godhead that I can't even begin to picture. I'm flabbergasted. And then I remember my own marriage and I remember all the times that I have wronged Barbara. I remember all the times when I have not acted for her, but acted for myself. Not thought of her needs, but thought of mine. And I recognize that this part of my life, like all the others, are spo- is spoiled and broken. We also, in recognizing that, recognize before you that every aspect of our life is spoiled and broken and we need your help in all of it. Lord Jesus, once again this morning, as so many times before, we ask you to fill our lives and to enter our minds and to renew them so that we may become more like what we were designed and created to be. We ask it in your name. Amen.